This brief talk is about what has been done in Venezuela regarding free software and specifically Debian. Uh, yesterday I was talking to a friend from Belgium and I, I was telling him that um, just as Germans do with SUSE, they feel uh, that, that a development that it's German and it's made by themselves and everything, we feel like Debian is uh, a thing of ours because Debian is a universal project that belongs to everybody that contributes uh, either by developing or using it. So in Venezuela, it's uh, we have a strong feeling for Debian, and this is a brief um, resume of what has been done in Venezuela regarding uh, specifically Debian. We have some legal precedents. Um, for example, in 1999, we approved a national constitution by referendum. And um, in the constitution, it said that science and technology are a matter of public interest. And I haven't really read all constitutions of the world, but it has been said that the constitution of Venezuela is one of the only in the world that has uh, such a statement that science and technology is of public interest. This means that we can justify more budget for science and technology than other countries that where it's not in the constitution uh, stated that, that this is full of interest. In 2000, there was a presidential decree in Venezuela, mm, sometimes making uh, legal decisions is um, very complicated. We have a three-power uh, three division, actually it's six powers, but um, for, the, for the foreigners, it's easier to explain that, that we have three powers. And um, the Congress, or the legislative power, is usually a stock of discu uh, dis in discussions of things that are not really interesting for the country. So the president some, but sometimes needs to say that um, a thing should be done. Like, for example, the decree 825 says that the nationwide free internet access is a state's priority policy. And from that decree, now in Venezuela we have like 10 or 20,000 internet access points where people can uh, uh, surf in the internet for like 100 bolivars, which is the national currency, and it's like uh, 20 cents of a dollar per hour. In a, that's why you see Venezuelans here in Europe screaming to the heavens when we see an, an internet cafe and an hour like 4 euro, 5 euro. It's really expensive for us. And um, in 2004, and this was the, the um, the most important of our legal president, there was a presidential decree, the 3390, that says that free software is to be used preferably in the national public administration. And in states such as Venezuela, national public administration means almost anything because the schools are under the national public administration, some universities are also under the national public administration, public health care, and enterprises. Uh, uh, enterprises that belongs to the state, for example, the oil company. So uh, this was a very worldwide uh, news when Venezuela decided to use free software preferably. It, it was not a, a, new, uh, a new initiative because Brazil and some other countries in 2003 and 2002 uh, were already deciding to use free software. But there's actually, uh, there's actually a motivation that um, makes Venezuela a, a key player in this uh, free software uh, thing that I will explain later. For now, I can say that um, due to this legal precedence, uh, typical state-run FOSS project may get up to $250,000 per year, which is lots of money. Um, and this is not including any other support you might get because uh, in a state like Venezuela, you can get, for example, um, food for, uh, for the developers and uh, accommodation for developers and um, you get the money apart from that. So 41% of the budget of Venezuela is set for so-called so so social expenditures, which is public health care, education, etc. And uh, one of these parts is science and technology. And um, since we sell oil to other countries, usually during the year we get additional funds. For example, last year 500 billion bolivars, which is lots of dollars, um, were injected to a project to, to Venezuela to have a, a satellite in a joint venture with China. So this happens all the time. You get more money because of oil sales. 
Um, so, for example, so in 1998, you couldn't get money from the oil sales. The, all the money from oil sales were to the central bank, and you couldn't use it. And we didn't use it to, to pay the debt, for example, the external debt that uh, ate the economies of most Latin American countries during the 20th century. Venezuela has paid it all, thanks for all the expenditures, and there's still something left for free software. So we have excellent e-government infrastructure because before of the of 2004, the presidential decree, we already have a constitution stating that science and technology is prioritary. We already have a decree saying that internet access was prioritary. So even with Windows on and proprietary software, we started to have an, a good e-government infrastructure. For example, um, if you have a little state or a little city that doesn't have money to get a server and a web page and all of, on all of, this, of that stuff, the national government can provide it and actually provides it, provides it using Debian. We, are, we have good hardware infrastructure. Um, the, in general, the country has money to buy new hardware. Hardware is mostly H HP based because HP has good links and um, providers in Venezuela. Um, and it's a good thing that HP has decided to provide support for Debian-based uh, solutions because we now have more support for, for Debian IT solutions in our country and we have uh, good internet connectivity uh, compared with the rest of the countries in Latin America. And in general, Latin America connectivity is very bad. Um, it's mostly satellite connections and it's, it's really uh, slow, but it's good. Uh, for example, uh, when we compare it with Colombia and Ecuador, Bolivia, and other countries of the of the region, so the motivations regarding this decision were political, economical, and social. Um, I don't tend to speak uh, of free software as a politics issue, but it has a part of that, and uh, that's why the the government decided to use free software because of sovereignty and national security. Um, in 2002, we had a national strike uh, promoted by people who opposed the government. And um, it, it doesn't care if they were right or they, or, or they were not right, but that affected oil sales. We stopped selling oil for like two or three months. And in the oil business, that, mean, that means you will not get money in one or two years. So uh, this was done through locking proprietary systems. The uh, oil company used it to have uh, Windows and proprietary software, and they just lock up everything. So they call up Linux hackers in order to uh, start up the, the enterprise again, and it's now selling like three million barrels per day. Um, and it's the only country left in the region with a strong and active nationwide migration plan. Brazil uh, has already profited because there was a uh, witch hunting in the government and the ministry in charge for that was dumped and Ecuador, Bolivia and other countries are starting to get uh, projects with free software but ha they have no money, no, no, or not as much money as Venezuela in order to improve it. So in the economical part we have had huge savings with, um, with free software. A small office say 150 people could save up to 100,000 dollars per year, which is lots of money for a small office, uh, just by moving away maintenance contracts. That means Oracle. If you get rid of Oracle and put like Postgres or MySQL or any other database, even text-based database for small uh, offices, you could save up to $100 a year. And um, if you continue not paying Windows licenses and Office licenses, you can save up a lot more. And even if you take into account the initial cost of ownerships of free software, which means training people and, and paying somebody to migrate your systems, it's even cheaper than the proprietary software. Because uh, when a country has money, like Venezuela, both proprietary software and free software-based companies are trying to steal money from the government. So uh, having an in-house migration plan means a lot of savings. In the social area, uh, FOSS has proved to be a, a fast way to improve IT literacy. There's a, there is a mission, a, a program in Venezuela in order to um, teach people how to read and write. And uh, like one million, one and a half million or two million people have already learned to read and write. So we are now a total, we are totally, uh, we have literacy, 100% of literacy in the country. 
and then we gave the people the opportunity to go to school and to go to university, but there was not an IT uh, education. So there's a nationwide Plan Nacional de Federación Tecnológica, Technological Literacy IT Plan, uh, which has trained until now. It started um, in the last quarter of 2006, has trained 200 people in the use of Debian, and is willing to benefit 1 million people by 2008. So uh, how does it work? You sign up at an office where you have internet access. We saw before that we have tens of thousands of internet access points in the whole country, so you sign up there, and you have a course with uh, a live CD, which is Debian, basically. It's made with Debian Live, actually, and Genome, and you learn how to use OpenOffice, and you learn how to use IceWeasel, and IceDove, and everything. Actually, people in Venezuela does not know what Firefox means. They know what is IceWeasel and IceDove. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the government also says, and this is a very political issue, that uh, some social policies that are inherent to false developments are also uh, the ones that they are defending. For example, uh, the community, the solidarity with other people, cooperation, and everything. So, they are happy with it, and it's a, and it's a good thing because even if uh, developers don't want to get involved in, in uh, political stuff, uh, you get the government support, which is always a good thing uh, when it has money and it has power to um, distribute your ideas to the whole country. So the actors or the parts uh, participating in this in this project uh, is the government, which is actually tr has three roles: a director, because by decree is the one that has to decide what to use and where to use it and how to use it. It's also a client because he buys services from other people. And he's and he's also a provider because he trains people when possible in the uh, IT literacy plan that we saw earlier. You may have heard of the IT literacy plan because Enrico Sini wrote to the DevConf discuss um, mailing list uh, after Mexico when he came to Venezuela and saw this project. And actually, Aniva also replied to him, and that was a, a good thread regarding that. There are also big enterprises willing to take money from the government in this, um, in this emergency of uh, free software migration, but um, they had their time in 2005 and they're actually out of, out of business now because they have uh, a shortage of personnel, they uh, lack good um, creative people. So yes, we have Novel in Venezuela, we have Red Hat in Venezuela, but for example, when you call Red Hat support line, uh, the, the telephone is picked up by an Argentinian. So the government doesn't like that. And they're also involved in problems of corruption. Uh, in 2005, a government officer uh, stated that uh, all government officers should use Red Hat Enterprise Linux. He was fired right away. And actually, uh, the, um, when you call to the office in charge of migration and you ask them what to use, they say Debian. We'll see that later. There are some medium and small enterprises which has um, probably um, lots of good people working with them, um, but they are also disregarded by the government. The government prefers to contract both cooperatives or communities, uh, people from the community, individual consultants and everything. So with cooperatives, it's, there's a, a, a great thing in Venezuela because they are supported by the government. So you can get a credit in a bank, you can get lots of resources that a medium or small enterprise or a big enterprise couldn't get uh, such easily. And the community is also a special case because it's completely decentralized, de-organized. De -organized. Uh, they usually don't get um, together to decide something or to, pro to promote something, but the government is always consulting them. You can see when a law is about to be, uh, or an IT-related law, is about to be passed to the Congress. The, there's always invitations to the mailing list of the Linux user groups and Debian developers groups and everything. So actually we have uh, been in the National Assembly in the, with all the representatives uh, speaking with them and telling what free software is and what Debian is. Actually we had uh, the opportunity to make a Debian talk in the Congress in front of all the representatives. So it's a good thing that the community is um, taking into account in this process because we have saved the government from taking bad decisions, for example, promoting the use of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which in Venezuela has um, a lack of support because you, the telephone support is in other country. There's no people, there's like four people working for Red Hat in Venezuela. 
and they have not translated a lot of documentation which is necessary for the government. So, um, it's a good thing that the community takes uh, a word in the in the migration. So the, the processes usually follow this um, uh, scheme of selecting, developing, and deploying. That's the title of this of the talk. Uh, small companies, private consultants, and co-ops are usually preferred. Um, some people differ uh, when they want to to make business with the government. They get together and form a cooperative. Some people don't like that idea, so they are private consultants. Um, most enterprises value the community participation. Actually, where I work. If somebody is about to be um, hired for data related work, the people at Human Resources Google for them in mailing list and Debian list and the wiki and everything to see if the guy is really involved. Um, and usual measures such as a nationwide publicly announced legislation process is usually not done because it's time consuming and it's also prone for corruption. Usually, um, when an IT um, project is about to be hired, the government has to publish in all the newspapers a call for licitation and everything, so that's not done uh, in free software-related projects. They usually happen really fast. Debian documentation is thoroughly used, especially when, we're, of course, we are talking about Debian-based IT solutions, especially the security handbook. That's why uh, some Venezuelans are working with the Spanish guys and Javier Fernandez and Guino Peña in order to translate the security handbook, an updated version of the security handbook to Spanish. And the documentation is always looking for in Spanish. That's uh, where the lack of good documentation in Spanish of Debian is uh, seen. Uh, we're trying to, we have like 15 collaborators from Debian maintainers and translators in Venezuela. We're trying to translate most of the, of the documentation which is available yeah. on the site. And also other community resources like Debian administration, the web page that's maintained by Steve Kemp, I think, and uh, forums and mailing lists are usually checked out when uh, a project is done. But Debian Venezuela, which is a group of developers in the country, is usually a first place for questions. You can find in the mailing list archives, you can find people from the government or from the state enterprises asking technical questions there. When you're developing a Debian based IT um, solution in Venezuela, most projects observe uh, Linux standard base and the file system hierarchy standard, the last version which Edge are compatible with, Debian policy and specific policies, uh, product oriented programming and agile programming is usually used in languages such as PHP and Perl. Java is heavily disregarded as a viable solution. We have a strong discussion in our country in 2005, I think. Uh, with the some microsystem people in Venezuela because they were saying that Java was free software and there was this discussion and finally the government said that it could be used but it's not uh, free software. Uh, and we need another discussion now after some has taken the decision of uh, releasing parts of the whole Java framework in, under the DPL but um, it's, you cannot find, it's, it's not easy to find a Java based project in Venezuela now which is regarded as a free software project. Uh, you can find lots of PHP solutions or Perl solutions, and if you want a graphic and uh, graphical user interface, you can see Glade being used with Perl and that kind of stuff, or Python. Also, um, proprietary software is only used when it compromises the viability of a mainly fossilized product. For example, when you have uh, 5,000 users uh, office which um, have a Flash-based web application. Uh, you need to have the flash plugin in the in nice whistle. So you are compromising a little bit the freeness of the whole development, or you are, but people will be, still be using Debian. Uh, and it needs aut authorization. There's a national office which gives authorization for the usage of, of proprietary software in, in the public administration. Uh, bugs and improvements must be reported to Debian in a usable way. Uh, that means you cannot write to the book tracking system saying this doesn't work. Uh, there are actually guidelines in Spanish for reporting bugs in a, use in a, in a good way. Uh, this has been done, however, in a small scale. The, you can, in the book tracking system, you will not see lots of Venezuelans reporting problems. And mainly, this is done through Debian Venezuela. The people usually contact developers in Venezuela and they state the problem, and we are the ones who open the, the book and follow the book in the book tracking system. About project management, <coughs> uh, we have year oriented budgets. In most projects, this is required by law. We cannot have a project that uh, has a duration of three months 
there is a project assigned for the whole year, but money will only be available for this for those three months. There are no strict timelines, so this makes a um, somehow good uh, environment for developers, which, as I stated earlier, have good resources to develop, have um, the support of the government, have uh, a, a guidelines for developing. So. Uh, that's why uh, we have lots of developers in Venezuela which are happy with the with their work. The usually a non-technical person is assigned to them as a, as a manager of the pro of the of the project. This is not a good thing, but it's necessary by law also that a people not related to the project uh, is also managing uh, the project. But usually people just ignore the manager and developers can freely do what they want. And I, actually, uh, there's a third point that it's not showing up there that the government has uh, its own Debian based GeForge software which is to be used by all national developments. So you can find it. Uh, oh, well, I give you the, the address later it's finde.gov.v. You may uh, have seen that in Venezuela we don't have, we have GOVB uh, from Venezuela, but we also have GOV from Belgium because. Um, GOV, uh, the lower V is uh, government in English, and GOV with Belgium is gobierno in Spanish, which is government also. Um, and when you are deploying, uh, almost any project will, re will require that the developers train other people in what uh, it, ha it has been done. That's why we have lots of people that understand what the project is, and that way um, you can also evaluate what the people has been done. There is a nationwide medium level training program in uh, free software, which is the software, uh, Free Software Academy, Academy of Software Libre. It receives recommendations from developers and teachers in Venezuela. It actually has um, evolved his pensum and, um, uh, uh, from decisions taken by, by groups of teachers in the country. Uh, this is medium level. This is not a high level um, training program. This is not a training program for developers. Uh, it's a training program for people who want to use uh, um, free software in a higher level than the uh, uh, literacy program that we saw earlier. The results of any project can be reported to this office, the IT office. Using these reports, the IT office may establish guidance and denies or approves any request for proprietary software research. For example, the, the National Library of Venezuela was deciding to use a proprietary software. They say that there was no uh, free software available for library management. So a friend of mine, which is a librarian, uh, and I presented a report um, about Core, which is MJ Ray also uh, participates in the development of Core, uh, which is um, a library management system. And uh, this way, the this IT office, which decides where to use proprietary software and where not, uh, decided to deny the the usage of of proprietary software at the national library. As of today, there's only one known authorization that I already told you that those parts of Sounds Java that still remain proprietary, those are authorized for its use. Uh, some state enterprises have uh, said that they want to use Java for their, their uh, uh, data acquisition systems and uh, most low level systems, so it's authorized. Debian in Venezuela is officially recommended by the Office in Charge of the Migration, which is the one I, I cited earlier, since 2006. If you call them and you say, hey, I have 150 new computers I want to install, free software on them, what should I do? They will send you a Debian Edge CD. There's a national distribution, however, it's a project, it's not uh, widely used. And um, actually, Christian, which is sitting there, actually participating in the development of that project. It uses the Debian package base, the Debian installer, and it's based on Debian's best practices. The, it has a live CD which is entirely made by Debian Live, and it has installer CDs which are made through preceding and uh, uh, all the best practices. We are not breaking Debian uh, package base, and it allows us to provide user with a national distribution which is customized to Venezuela, but uh, you can install any of the thousands of packages available in Debian. Networking and e-government platform uses Debian since 2006. Um, as I already said, if you are a small city and you need a server in order to store your information, the government will give you one, but it will be Debian based. There's no way that you can get a Windows server or a SUSE or Red Hat based server or, or even an Ubuntu server. 
Uh, by the way, Ubuntu is uh, lately has been highly disregarded uh, because of Mark Schulwald's uh, statements about Venezuela and his political uh, position. Uh, I'm not really, um, I, I don't really support discrimination by political position, but uh, the government does it, and uh, Ubuntu is uh, his his words have um, damaged a little bit Ubuntu's image in Venezuela. Yet there is a strong community of Ubuntu Venezuela, which is Ubuntu Venezuela and you can find them at ubuntu.org.be. The National Electoral Authority, which I contacted for the special purpose of this talk, uh, uses exclusively Debian for the network backend. So all elections are run by Debian. In the backend, we use um, voting machines, uh, which is not a good thing. Uh, some people say that manual voting is better. I sometimes agree. Um, but um, the, the system is um, open, you can see the code. It's not uh, Debian based, but we have already installed Debian on the voting machine, so it will not be uh, too far away when we actually vote on Debian machines. But the whole network by Ken is Debian based. They invite people of the community. If you ever go to Venezuela, you can contact um, a friend of mine in the National Electoral Authority, which will invite you to see the whole a server room and you can take a, uh, a look at the, at the code of the electoral system and anything. State enterprises, uh, most state enterprises have decided to use free software even when they are not mandated by law. Um, if, a, if a state enterprise it's depends of the government then it's mandated by law, but there are some that uh, there are not mandated but they still decide to use free software. For example, PDVSA, which is the uh, state oil company, has decided to migrate their, their servers and desktops to Debian specifically. Uh, they haven't released information on that yet. I couldn't contact anybody there that um, yeah, stated to me any numbers or details about that. There's one or two or three guys of PDVSA here in the in DevConf. Um, you can uh, ask them later. But CVD Edenta, which is a um, um, company which produces energy based on uh, Hydro, uh, hydraulic production exclusively, we don't use thermal production. Uh, actually produces <coughs> equivalent in clean, so company energy of almost uh, 450,000 barrels per day, which is like uh, one sixth of the production of oil in Venezuela. Has already migrated their servers to Debian. Several specialized applications have actually been um, taken to Debian and 500 uh, by the by today 500 people of their end users in business critical areas use Debian also we have a custom Debian distribution there uh, and we have Puppet which is uh, somehow substitute for CF engine and it's very good to distribute orders to the whole network so we have 500 people migrated we are migrating like 15 people per day and uh, we expect to have, at December 2007, 3,000 uh, 3, 3, Debian desktops migrated to Debian in uh, Elerica, which is um, a state enterprise. Private enterprises are progressively starting to use free software, especially because they feel that they will not be compatible with the government. Um, some other enterprises have just installed open office and they will share um, documents in the open document format with the government. And also since several small services companies and private consultants are working with Debian, there are several cases of Debian-based private enterprises. In uh, who's using Debian in the web page, you can see one, which is Seguro uh, Nuevo Mundo, an insurance company, which is very big. In, uh, it's a car insurance company. And they have most of their network in, in Debian. Actually, um, in the universities, in the, in the academic area, most universities are now featuring a course or, or two regarding free software. Uh, even when their main pensum is based on, on proprietary software and they use free software for network development of new applications. Some universities are using Debian specifically in their network backends. For example, the UNESR um, has the first official Debian mirror which is official since Debian Edge. Um, and in some cases their teachers endorse the use of Debian. When I say endorse is that they um, threaten their, their their students. If you don't use Debian, I will. You will not pass this. <laughs> but it's okay because um, the students usually tend to go to in Venezuela. Usually tend to go to Fedora. Uh, I don't know by why uh, why they are doing that. But uh, we have the case of one teacher, which is also a maintainer, but it's not here. That says to the to their students that they would not pass his course if they don't change to Debian, and they usually do. <laughs>
Well, in conclusion, good things of this, um, of the migration until now, is that the community user base has grown a lot since 2005. We have uh, user groups even in cities with less than 2,000 inhabitants. Uh, there's a big number of activists working uh, on free software, so when we have to do a demonstration in the National Assembly because of the decision they're taking, there's a good number of people. Uh, Devon is highly regarded as, as the national standard uh, since 2005 it's been, it's been used in critical institutions. Uh, before that we have Devon in, in the government but it was not mandated by law and it was not nationwide. The, use, the using of Debian by the government has made private enterprises and end users to interest in free software, which is a good thing also, because we want uh, Debian to be used by er, uh, everybody in the country, not just the government. Since there are some more budgets, not budget for science and technology, uh, the savings that are being done uh, by using free software are being reinvested in training or developing uh, new products. Debian is being recommended, and the most Debian policies are observed in all developments. And decisions regarding free software are consulted with the communities, which has prevented some catastrophes. For example, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux case, which was, uh, we have a, an insider which uh, took us the, the letter and we scanned it and published it on the newspapers and everything, and that's why we saved the country from using Red Hat and now we are using Debian. Bad things is that uh, free software seems to be taken into account as a political issue in some cases. Uh, this state of mind needs, needs to be res reversed as soon as possible. Uh, we need to tell people that free software is a matter of the whole country, not just the government, or, or not just by a political position. Uh, developments are not yet integrated to the national policies, either because they are not willing to do it or because they don't know about them. The, we need to do, uh, inside Venezuela, a, a work communicating these policies that I've already told you, the selecting, developing, and deploying uh, a scheme. And the state is very bureaucratic, uh, like most Latin America or big states that with lots of money. And it's hard to set up a project in a standard way. Uh, that's why people from outside that comes to Venezuela usually just take their hairs off when they see how projects are done in Venezuela. And that's why, uh, for example, our proposal for DEPCOMP 8 uh, had a lack of, of um, ordering because the government says, yes, I will give you money, I will give you a million dollars but you need to, to, to tell them that the Debian team has already decided to do it in Venezuela and you need to tell them where and everything. So it's a very, a very weird way to do things. But when it happens, uh, there are a lot of resources available. The government usually provides money and uh, food and transportation. And when the, when the liter of gas costs like two cents of a dollar, uh, it's easy to transport people. Uh, and we don't even have like 5% of the, of the um, contribution to global warming of the whole region. That's weird. Uh, but uh, it's a good thing in general to have the government supporting Debian. Uh, it's a good thing if we can uh, provide the Debian upstream with the experiences that we have had in Venezuela, especially book reports and um, patches and improvements. Uh, the national distribution team uh, sent to the Debian Live people a, a patch regarding uh, init ng support in the Debian in Live CDs. So that's a good thing. Uh, it needs to happen faster. It needs to happen in a more um, distributed way. But in general, this, these are the advanced on, on free software in Venezuela. I would like to show you um, a funny video because it has the president there. This day he said uh, to the people, this was uh, a national broadcast in the radio and television. Uh, this was two years after he decreed to the use of free software and he said that um, he has noted resistance to the migration to free software and he's stating in his very own way, which is uh, if you have heard him in, uh, in uh, the news or anything, you know he has a very explosive way of telling things. He's saying that he will point his shotgun to anyone who is uh, opposing to free software. And of course, when uh, people in charge of IT in the government hear, hear that, they move very fast uh, in their process of migration. So he's also saying that uh, there need to 
to migrate to free software uh, because we don't want to depend on external uh, decisions. And this is the part where he knows. He says that people say that it doesn't work. He asked a report, a national report, and he's saying that he will point. He's saying that his shotgun breaks all the resistance to, to the migration. So the, this was at the opening of a of a center of investigation in Merida, which is a city with uh, lots of academic stuff. And um, there's actually a, the PDVSA state oil company has a center for investigation there. And there's also a government-based um, investigation center. And there's the university. And everything in Merida is uh, free software-based and data based particularly. So um, thank you very much for coming. Comments are very welcome, uh, especially if you have comments regarding the politics behind all this stuff. I wouldn't like to discuss them here because uh, politics is a very uh, difficult issue to take, uh, specifically in a big event like that, where there are lots of opinions. Uh, these are my addresses, uh, and also I added the Debian Venezuela webpage and mailing list if you ever want to. Uh, read the archives, it's of course Spanish based, but it will be good for your Spanish to read this. Um, if you have any questions or comments now about uh, what has been done, they will be welcome. And uh, thank you very much. I also will upload the slides to the Pentagon and the video. So if you want to. And I have a translation, but I didn't have time to. I don't know how to use case or title, so I, I couldn't uh, do it. <laughs> about uh, the deployment of desktops. You said that uh, you are using Puppet for the configuration, but as far as I know, puppets can only be used if there's also a system running. So how do you install and deploy the machines if there's nothing on it? Okay. Um, for example, uh, this of the Puppet stuff is in a state based in a state enterprise. Uh, what we have done is to add the packages to, the, to a Debian CD and proceed the installer in order to install them. And uh, Puppet by default looks for a machine name Puppet in the network every 30 minutes. So we have a machine name Puppet in the network. And uh, it, uh, the first thing what that we did, it was send a package, uh, a dummy package, which is named actualizador or actualizer, which depends on any package that we, we want to install uh, on them. So in desktops, that's what, uh, that's what we did. We preceded the installer. So it means if you have to install, for example, 3,000 desktops, you will have one CD and go from desktop to desktop. If we have to install lots of machines, we have a system imager server, and okay. we do that by that way. Or uh, we, we also use the, um, a modified version of the, of the Win32 installer of Debian. Uh, which has the source code available, and you can change the paths for the for the kernel the, and the init run disk. So uh, we have also a kernel in, initial run disk in our servers. We have a, a, a local mirror, of course. Um, we have uh, a, a Debian mirror and symbolic links to all missing packages. We have we only maintain like 800 packages of of the whole mirror, and we have some symbolic links to the other ones. So if people want to install, say case of tiles, they will find it. And it's, it's mostly automated. That, that's why we do like 15 or 20 installations a day. It's uh, distributed. We don't have uh, only one place in the country where this company has like six, seven locations in the whole country and sloppy connections between them. So mm -hmm. we, we also have uh, redundancy in, in those uh, other places. So, so this works fine for you or are you thinking about uh, more central management thing to deploy the machines? This works fine for us, but um, if the network is okay, the central management will be will be just fine. 
uh, government uh, in general, the national distribution does not provide any any of of that, of that because uh, it's to be used in places that have no connection. Actually, in um, in our company, we have uh, LDAP uh, authentication through PAM, so we have to use a secret PAM in order to catch it, uh, to make a cache of the credentials because when the network goes down, then well everything. So. Um, for companies, it's a, it's a good way, and it's also publish it. Uh, the puppet thing I did it myself, so I published it in Spanish in my weblog, uh, in order to other people to be able to reply that uh, experience in their own in their own company. It, we have like 400, uh, 4,500 nodes in the whole network. Uh, from those, 3,000 3, will be migrated in this year, or maybe the first quarter of 2008. Uh, and we are looking forward to keep using Puppet as the as the central management system. We, in Windows, we use a uh, software named SMS, but I don't know about that. And Puppet allows you to easily uh, install packages and add local users, change. For example, uh, we're planning to change the root password of the whole uh, machines daily. So, because people uh, usually get the root password to do stuff and uh, we're looking to change it with Puppet. Do you try FA? What? Do you FAA? Do you FAA. Try that? Yes, uh, we have tried that, but we like more system imager and, and this and this method of doing stuff. Also, uh, we have lots of people that uh, needs to do something during the day. So the, so it's a bad thing to automate everything. Yes, because so they, do not have they will <laughs> just be staring at the screen. Look, oh yeah, new machine. No, and they also, um, we cannot just migrate, for example, we evaluated the possibility of making a, uh, in the DHCP server of the whole network, sending a boot image, but uh, there are specialized applications in Windows that uh, only work in Windows, so we need to move them to terminal server or anything until we uh, develop new applications, so that needs a guy going there and taking the installer and going, so Always the, the user support is, supporting the user is a good thing because they will eat you if you want. They have telephones, so they will start calling you, <coughs> which is a bad thing. Um, but I think if you sh could automate the deployment thing, you will save some money or, or work time, which you then can spend into education of the users. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you recommend specifically for? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> since, since I'm the author of Phi, uh, I would recommend you to use Phi. Uh, I think the, the problem with system images is that it does not scale very well if you have very different environments. And, and I don't think that your desktops are all really completely equal. And so if you have, for example, a, a certain setup for department R and department B, um, as far as I know, with system image, you, you have to create so, some, some golden image or master images, and normally these images are always made by hand, and that's not good in my opinion. Yes, there are maybe actually you have to remove ULEP rules in order to them to reply correctly. Yes, we, we will take a look at, at system image, but actually, um, for, by now we are just uh, making one image for everyone. Um, okay. Of course, it has proof applications. Uh, people didn't like eBeans, the PDF reader of Genome, so we have KPF and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but of, of course, it needs to be done by hand. Yeah. Another question. Yeah, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk about um, these deployment of, I understand, there are community centers sponsored by government where yes. you have computers and all that. How many are, are these and um, how are you dealing with the um, configuration of these machines and maintenance? I'm telling you this because I uh, come from Mexico where the government uh, started a program six years ago to deploy computers in schools and uh, I think the number uh, uh, is right now is like 20,000 schools on an average 25 machines. But a recent report uh, by the newspaper says that 60 to 70 percent of those machines have been disabled because of uh, different problems with the operating system, Windows, of course. So uh, basically this program has been halted and there's uh, uh, at this moment a, a big audit going on because of uh, all these failures. So how are you dealing with all these 
problems. And, and, and uh, in Mexico, what happened was that once a computer acquired a virus, for example, there was no one around to just go and do a reinstall. There, there wasn't any available uh, skills because of the isolation of many of these schools. So how are uh, you dealing with these problems there? Okay, usually um, these uh, internet access centers, which are called info centers, or info centers, actually the name is recited in El Salvador and other Central American countries. Mm -hmm. uh, usually they are associated with other services provided by the government. For example, since healthcare uh, in the last two, three years of the 20th century in Venezuela was really going down. Um, since 2000, we have called Cuban doctors to come help uh, and bring medical attention to poor communities in Venezuela. So we usually have this um, little hospital of the town asso associated with the Internet Access Center, associated with, a, for example, a, a house of the community where they can gather and um, make uh, meetings about their problems and they can uh, send information to the government about new projects that they are required. And they are usually associated also with um, educational centers, for example, um, aldeas, uh, aldeas bolivarian, um, bolivarian um, towns, yeah, which are, which are ed education centers for people with low resources. And they're usually all in the same place. So there's always people around, and particularly in the internet access center, um, is usually the people of the community is being trained about how to maintain it and the maintenance of the of the, of the machines is done by local services uh, in the community for example a small company or uh, even paid access uh, internet access centers just decide to uh, move their business away and provide support to the government access center which is cheaper and um, because it's cheaper lots of more people go there so um, actually, I don't know exactly the number, but it's measured on tens of thousands of uh, internet access centers in the country. Um, lately, it has been going down. The number of new access points uh, um, opening in the country is like, for example, in this year, I think a thousand more will open. Um, but uh, they are now being trained in Caracas, which is the capital of Venezuela. They are being trained on free software and uh, Linux and Debian particularly uh, in order to migrate those machines, which some of them are in Windows, uh, but some of them are also in Debian since uh, several years ago. And since they only provide internet access, it's okay to use Debian because we have great internet um, capabilities uh, for browsing and everything. And actually, we can use, uh, I've been promoting the idea of using uh, uh, open kiosk. Uh, I don't know how do you spell it, but um, this day on live based uh, live CD that has only the browser and everything that I think Guy Henry is working on that. Uh, so that's, a, that's the idea with the Internet Access Center. Um, they are actually, uh, those that has uh, Debian now are doing the IT Literacy Center plan uh, which has uh, for a week like 20 to 30 people having this course on Debian and they may be people that uh, has um, no proper university preparation just a secondary school preparation but they want to use a computer or they want to begin to know what what free software is all about so they can have access in a, in, a, in this public access point and uh, aside from that there's a project uh, of uh, setting up laboratories with computers in schools. Uh, most of them are, are going out with Ubuntu or a Debian based distribution. Um, I don't know how to number because I don't work with them and they didn't provide. I asked them, uh, I actually asked all the officers of the government in the country for numbers and information about that, but uh, some told me that I have to go there and ask for information or go to the public relationships office or other, other provide me numbers, but I didn't cite them uh, here because of lack of space. Uh, I thought that the election office was a good example because of, well, its relevance in the country. And schools is also another uh, good example, but they didn't give me any information. I know, because I have been there, that uh, some of their, of their access points inside the schools have uh, Debian, and also the national government provides support for them. If uh, a school in, say, the middle of the country, in, uh, in 
well, a yeah, very not good uh, urbanized or, or urban like uh, city, uh, the government can go there and, and provide them support. And it usually happens past like a week or, or something. So they don't have that downtime. And um, another thing that I want to tell you is that Venezuela is not officially in the one laptop per child project. Uh, the web page, I think that it used to appear in yellow, meaning that they have showed some interest on the project, but um, uh, they, we haven't signed any agreements with uh, the people at MIT uh, in order to get this project. Uh, we have a, a computer assembly industry in the country, which is a joint venture with China, again, and uh, we make computers, laptops, and desktop computers and workstations. Um, but this is was this was a good thing to, to 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 say that we don't have any problem with the one laptop per child. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, we asked the Venezuela asked for two much two prototype boards of the of the one laptop per child prize, but we didn't get any. Uh, the Argentinian people, which have said that they wanted uh, the the machine, uh, they have. Uh, um, made a, a local distribution named Gututo, which is what Richard Stallman used, big, mm, I don't know since when, because he used to use Debian. But he, he now he's using Gututo because Debian is not free software, uh, he says. So um, that's this the situation. On internet access centers, usually are community centers with lots of services, lots of people around, and maintained by the community. Uh, both the attendant is uh, probably a guy from the community and the, the service guy that goes and change the printer toner and uh, change parts of the equipment is also from the community. And, and these are the people that have been trained as... as, as uh, these people sure. have probably been trained not only in the IT literacy program but also in the Free Software Academy which is a higher level program. Mm -hmm. So they know a little bit more about, uh, you know, they know um, shell commands and they know how to do advanced stuff for which I, an, end, an end user shouldn't have to be doing um, if they don't want to. So, uh, but the IT literacy plan is, uh, you can see a, 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 a guy from a farm doing that course because it's just, hey, hey, this is a computer. It might be the first time they are seeing a computer and it's a good thing that uh, they see it with Debian because uh, then when, when he goes to a machine with Windows, he will say, ah, what's that? Uh, I cannot use my usual stuff, the, 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 the type of things people say when going to Debian from Windows. So it's generally a good thing. And uh, it's said also that uh, children in, in five years or so will, will not know what Windows is because they will be using free software or they are, they are just, uh, from the environment, they are taking just free software so they will, they will think that that's only what's about. I can give you, you know, you're from Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. I can give you numbers and information later. Sure. And also Damoc, David Moreno Garza, has been to Venezuela and, and saw this, this stuff, so you can also tell how it's like, and it's different uh, with Mexico. Yeah, we, 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 we proposed the government uh, of some scheme based on live CDs, and it was made of support based, and uh, they definitely didn't take it. They prefer to pay. They are going to start paying Microsoft three hundred million dollars a year from two thousand and nine on. So if uh, nothing happens, then we lose all the contracting. So yes, we um, in the National Assembly the the day that people of Debian went there was because the um, the Windows guys and the Microsoft guys, uh, not only Microsoft, but also students that were in the Microsoft Student Network and uh, and that kind of a strange uh, <coughs> sects, you know, the, the, the groups of evil stuff that they do there. They look at code in, in a GIF, you know, in a GIF image with all <coughs> these, these uh, uh, things that so they cannot OCR it. Um, so they were the National Assembly saying that they will be left without job if free software was to be used by the government. So they were proposing the, this concept of neutrality. You know, you don't you don't decide. But neutrality is just uh, stating that you are going to stay what what you have. And we have Windows. We have Windows. And if we are going to be neutral, we are going to continue to have Windows for ever. 
And that's actually the, the Microsoft position. You have to be neutral. You can choose Linux, yes. But if you have Windows, you won't be choosing Linux, uh, most likely. So um, we fight against that idea. And uh, Venezuela, Venezuela is not uh, a neutral country. That's a political position us. We are not neutral. We have a strong position against this kind of stuff. And the kind of social uh, things that the government think uh, come from Microsoft is, is not uh, compatible with their political position. So Microsoft is just, uh, here they are trying to, to keep uh, private companies uh, with them. And so do SAP, for example. Uh, they're trying to keep private companies with them because they know the government will be lost in like two or three years completely. Uh, for example, Office will be out of, out of business and Windows in a bit more, two or three years will be out too. Uh, SAP will stay a little bit more because they have a client in, in Linux, so uh, you can use it uh, from there. Um, but in general, it's uh, the whole situation with the big companies is they are going out of business because either they only work with proprietary software or they don't have enough people to provide support for free software solutions. So just as a side note, in Mexico uh, last year, the government of Vicente uh, Fox prepared a law uh, forbidding the use of open uh, software, of free and open software. And uh, the rationale was that uh, it could infringe, it could potentially infringe the intellectual property of uh, companies. Well, actually, in Venezuela, the of, of patents office, which managed both patents and intellectual property, uses Debian since 2004. I used to work there. The whole patent system is Debian-based. We have HP software and storage area networks running with Debian uh, since Sarge. Actually, we had a, an alpha uh, server running 2.0 Debian, uh, or I don't know which, which version. And, um, um, there are no software patents in Venezuela that are forbidden. You cannot patent software there, so uh, that's why people in Venezuela use MP3 and all those patented um, licenses because we just we just don't care about that. There are no patent software, uh, as well as there are no live beings uh, patents. You cannot patent live. You cannot patent DNA. You cannot patent uh, new species of uh, flowers or animals or anything. So that's why we don't care about the intellectual property infringements of free software, which there are not. But um, um, the software is, n is not very um, willing to listen to those uh, arguments about not using the software. Well, have a nice lunch. Yeah, final, just a final word. Some people are interested to these stories about people switch, uh, countries switching to free software. I may invite you to come on Friday, I think, in the morning, Tema Gere should be talking about the journey of Bhutan to free software. So you're welcome, and I hope that Tema Gere will be here because he's not here yet. But uh, anyway, if, even if he doesn't come, uh, I think that Hans Pop and I will handle something to explain this quite nice story. And the other Venezuelan girl who was going to speak um, uh, after lunch here in the lower ballroom is hasn't has arrived, so I think the but fully free, so we should speak with the Bhutan speak to with the Bhutan talk. Yeah, but don't try this. Yes. <laughs>